What's up, guys? Guys, I'm so pumped up to preach God's word tonight, so you guys better be ready. I just feel, I remember Pastor CJ and I'd come in uh, high school and he'd talk about that he'd get so excited before speaking. And he'd say he'd get so excited more than he did when he played basketball. And I remember him saying that. I'm like, like, are you smoking something? Is this like, right? But then I'm here and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is what he's talking about. This is, I love being able to speak God's word to you guys and be able to see a light go off in your head because not long ago I was sitting in your seats and I didn't understand the whole God thing. And so my heart is for you guys to be able to understand that your heavenly father loves you tonight. With that being said, I just want to honor my pastors who give me the opportunity to be up here, Pastor Jordan and Rachel. Yep, let's give it up for them. They've been role models for me growing up in my life. Uh, my youth pastor is like, since I was down here, and so I just want to thank them for being such great leaders now and since I was growing up. But last week, my guy killed it, Pastor Josh, when he was talking about relative truth. Were any of you here last week? Yeah. If, Exactly. You know how good of a message it was. And if you didn't see it, I encourage you guys to look back at it on our YouTube channel. He was talking about relative truth. And it's kind of what's going on in our society right now. What's true for me may not be true for you. And truth, for some reason, is circumstantial. But he was talking about how God keeps us uh, this truth. And we base all our beliefs and our morals off this God. And this comes with absolute truth. And it's actually not because he's trying to keep us from having fun, but he's trying to keep us from falling flat on her face. I just thought that was so good. Uh, but in the sermon series called Streaks, I kind of was reminded when I was back in high school and all those surface, surfacey relationships that I had uh, with Snapchat and everything. And I was reminded, uh, you, guys, you guys will probably know, bear with me as I explain this. I'm pretty sure you guys have the same type of thing that I'm talking about. Just try to think of this friend in your head. So there was a guy in my science class, and this is the same for like every single year. He wasn't someone that I went into the class knowing, but I ended up like becoming good friends with him because we shared like a 45 minute time period together and we became kind of close. We talked about homework. This dude was my lab buddy. We kind of got close, but it was in the context of class. If I saw him outside, it kind of would be like, hey, did you get the science homework done? It wasn't, it wasn't like a very deep relationship. And so I remember when the quarter was done and uh, we didn't have class anymore, we would see each other in the hallways and be like, hey, what's up, man? I miss class together. But as weeks went by and quarters went by, it was kind of almost awkward. He became like a stranger to me. And I just thought that was so weird how like our relationships work. But I realized this is kind of what we do with God. And uh, I, God was kind of putting on my heart that this is a lot of times how we treat him. I guarantee every single one of you has wanted God to move in your life or you've wanted to have some miraculous experience with God. Am I right? I'm sure every, everybody wants to have experience, right? But nobody wants to have the consistency uh, more than just a 45-minute service here on a Wednesday night. We expect God to move, but we don't put in things in place in a discipline where we're spending time. Because just like a friend, it's a relationship with God. And I just have this, guys, for you, to, the rule of thumb for tonight I want you guys to hang on to. Our lack of patience makes God an acquaintance. Our lack of patience makes God an acquaintance. See, we want all these things to move in our life. We want to see God. We want to get slapped across the face uh, with some message, but we don't really want to put in the work. And, and so I did a thing this last week, uh, and it involved a police officer. And just, you can just watch the video. Yeah. Oh, bro. Take it like a man. I'm so scared. <laughs> You're going to take it now. Ready? Yep. Oh, oh, gosh. <laughs> so that video, <laughs> you, you can applaud for that. I don't know why you would. But that video kind of reminded me of our experience with Jesus and how we're all looking for a lightning bolt in the sky to say, go to church. And then we're like, oh, that God moved, so I'm going to go to church. Or we expect for Jesus himself to pick us up by the hand and say, I am real and that's the, the type of experience we want. We're, we're chasing a feeling, but we're not chasing a being. Do you know what I mean? We're chasing a feeling. We're not chasing a being. We want to get tased by God and leave service with an ooey-gooey feeling and butterflies in our stomach, but we don't want to put things in place to continue to grow that relationship. And so a lot of times I find why we get that 
the people that leave NYC or leave camp and they're so bought out for, they're so sold out for Jesus and they're on fire is because they take that feeling but when they leave this utopia around Christians, they go back to their regular life, and since they didn't have any things in place, they begin to associate God with a feeling. God, why aren't you moving like you did at camp? I was singing oceans, and I know I felt you. I felt something, and so we get so confused because we start to associate him with a feeling, and so when we're outside of that, it just doesn't make sense, and we're almost confused. We think that a lack of feeling makes means a lack of closeness with this God and our relationship, but that's just not the case. And so how do we do this, though? How do we get a closer relationship with God? I think that our, our faith determines his face. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? Hold on, let me, I see it all throughout scripture, and you guys can fact check me after this, but I was reading, and it talks about how we draw near to God, and God says he's gonna draw near to us. And I know, I know my God's not a liar, so let me take that and put that in my back pocket and think about that later. And I remember when I was doing soap, I kind of jump around on soap, by the way. If you don't have your soap bookmark, get that. You can find Amanda after service. Anyways, so I was going through my devotions, and I just began to read, and I was kind of studying Jesus' healings. And I, I found something that was, like, interesting that I didn't catch before, that after each healing he had, it wasn't that God just came and touched someone and they were healed and he walked away, but there was a second half of that. After every time someone was healed, it was by their faith they were healed. By their faith they were healed. It's this two-way street. And so that's encouragement for you guys, that God gives you an opportunity to set things in place, to pursue him so in order you, you can understand and see his face. I just think that's so cool. And this is where I find myself uh, reading uh, this, this story, and it's a lot about faith. And when I'm, when I'm reading it to you, you guys are going to understand why. So Jesus just gets done preaching and uh, he's, he's telling his disciples, his followers, hey, guys, you go ahead of me, get in the boat, cross the sea. I'll be there in a second. I got to greet my fans. I got to dap everybody up, like say, hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for bringing the kids. How's Tommy? He's good. Okay. Yeah, you guys go get in the boat and go across the street. And um, so as he's doing that, he goes up, prays with the father, and the disciples are left in the middle of Hurricane Katrina in the sea where Jesus nowhere to be found. And this is where we find ourselves in this story. If you guys open up to, what, what is it? Matthew, is, I think it's on the screen. You'll see it. So we're gonna see yourself in Matthew 14, 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch in the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And I've read this story a thousand times like you guys probably have. But again, God, I felt like was showing me a little deeper side of the story that maybe you guys maybe have experienced, but I didn't, so I thought it was weird. Uh, Peter and these disciples had been walking with Jesus. You know what I mean? They were, they were just at this guy's sermon before. They were seeing him do these miraculous healings, and they knew this guy, but when they, they saw him in the midst of the storm, they saw he was a stranger. They were, they were terrified, and they didn't know who this, this guy was, and they were screaming out, ghost. And the reason why... I, I felt like God was telling me is because they only knew him in one area. They knew the Jesus in the Sunday school. They didn't know Jesus in the storm. See, they only, they were, this was their friend, the 45-minute class. They knew one side of Jesus. They had such a one-dimensional view of him that they left him like kind of compartmental. Like, here, you stay here. I don't think you can move in these other areas of my life. And so they began to see Jesus as one-dimensional. And I, I think we do the same thing with him. Like I said before, we begin to see Jesus only as a, as a God that stays here. Like, he only operates in this space. Jesus is the God of all things. Like, he moves everywhere. You guys can cheer for that. I know I get excited for that. That gives me goosebumps. Jesus moves everywhere. And so... But, but he's not confined to this one area. And matter of fact, if he's the God of all things, he's also the God of our storms. And just like when we think that we don't have that feeling, 
So when pain comes our way, we begin to blame God. God, that doesn't make sense. So we point a finger because we don't have a feeling that he's there. And when we're feeling hurt, we assume that God's punishing us. But Jesus operates all areas of our life if we allow him to. Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to force his way into your life and rescue, rescue you and take away your pain, but he'll use it for you. And so as we go into the next side of our verse, I'll begin to kind of explain a little bit what I'm getting at. Hold on. This is, it's, a, it's marinating right now. You're gonna, we're going to get to the good stuff in a second. So it's Matthew 14, 28 through 30. We begin, and Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? This kind of shook me a little bit, but, it, but it, uh, I related it to my life. See, this pain that, that you experience can do two things. It can make you a leader or it can make you a monster. And it's all on the basis of what you give God. It can make you a leader or it can make you a monster. And it's funny because God will use the things the enemy meant to harm us and he'll use it as the greatest tool to shape us. It's, it's like, you know, God almost like, I just see like a, a backhand to Satan when he does that. It's like, funny, you think this is going to destroy my kid? Watch me turn it on you and make him into the leader you never thought you would see. Yeah. Another thing I look at this is Peter's faith. This dude had incredible faith. And Jesus is is saying that he has, he has little faith. He said, oh, you have little faith. Oh, Peter. I'm thinking, like, who am I then if this guy is walking in the middle of Hurricane Katrina because a silhouette figure that he doesn't even recognize that he just called a ghost five seconds ago, he's like, oh, it's a ghost. The guy says, come. And he's like, okay. I'm going to walk into Hurricane Katrina, and I'm just going to keep walking. And he's walking on water. And then Jesus says, you're not cutting it, Peter. You have little faith. And I was thinking that, and I didn't understand this whole story or this part of the verse or what Jesus said until I had to experience it in my own life. And so to give you uh, context, uh, me growing up, I had a, I had a great family. Uh, my mom was a children's pastor. My dad was heavily involved in the youth. I knew all the stories uh, of Jesus. I, I knew who this God was, and they loved me like crazy. My parents would kill for me. They would die for me. But I, and, and because of this, I had, I had such a great relationship with my family. I absolutely loved them. They were, they were so close to me. I mean, I got a tattoo of my mom on my arm, for goodness sakes. Like, I love, I was a mama's boy. I love my family. And then kind of something happened where I stepped into a new position at a church. I moved out. I was kind of almost separated from my family. And so things in my family, I started noticing the unhealth and the dysfunction that I kind of was blind to before because it was just an everyday part of me. And I was around uh, leaders and mentors where things just weren't adding up. And uh, one thing, my dad struggled with drugs my whole life. It's been, it was on and off. And I didn't think it was such a big deal because it was just this constant recurring thing. Uh, he would fall into his temptation and then he would be sympathetic and it would just be, okay, dad's good now. Everything's, everything's clear. And, but this would be this constant cycle and this unhealth where my mom, uh, bless her heart, she, she took that all on herself. And because she didn't want to hurt us kids, she wore that and she hid it and kicked it under the rug thinking it was going to protect us just because she didn't want her kids to experience that. But when I got outside the house, I started understanding and me being a fixer and hating conflict uh, even to the point of unhealth, I saw this and I wanted to step in. And so I th I'm thinking since, oh, I'm, I'm doing pastoral school, I'm working at a church, I can handle this. I'll give them A, B, and C like everybody else. It's, I was so impersonal and I was so numb to it. And I remember caught my, my sister crying on the phone and just saying like, she's, she's pursuing Jesus and these things keep happening with, with our family. Why is dad doing this again? I remember just crying on the phone and it's hurting me. I just got to act like it's all cool. I had to be that, that figure in my family and act like, oh, it doesn't matter. Just, just numb to it. It's just every day. This is always what dad does. It'll, it'll pass by. Let's kick it under the rug. And 
I remember one time, like, he, he started coming home, and he was whatever he was on. My, my siblings were starting to see that, and I was not going to put up with that. I'm not going to have you affect them like that affected me. And I was seeing the unhealth, and I just remember talking to my mom. We confronted the situation, and we're like, it's done. We're not kicking things under the rug anymore. And I remember her moving out, and they, they separated. And... Um, I remember being just so numb to this. Talking, I've only experienced this side because I was moved out. I experienced my dad and the unhealth over a phone. So it was never personal for me. It was numb. And I remember one time going back to the house and, um, oh my gosh, oh. <laughs> we, were, uh, we were going back to the house and I was helping my, my mom move the rest of her things out of her house. And um, again, I remember my dad sitting there on the couch and he was sitting on the, I remember, like vividly, I remember it. He was sitting here in his chair, like he always did. And I'm thinking, I'm going to come in there. I'm going to tell him what's up. I'm going to tell him A, B, and C, get your life right. And I'm going to save him. And so I go there and sit on the couch and everything that I thought I was going to say went out the window. I just saw my dad and his shame and being hurt and knowing that he was, he was doing wrong and he failed me. This is a guy that I looked up to my whole life spiritually someone I loved and seeing them like this, right? Didn't know I was going to have to be this, this role in my family. And I remember just, I didn't know what to do. I just got up and said, dad, I don't judge you. I, I remember just hugging him. And first time, like I heard my dad cry and just tell him, I love you. And that's all I did. Walked away. And at that point, I just said, God, I can't do it. You're going to have to do something. God, I give it to you. I can't, I'm not strong enough like I thought I was. Jesus, this is uncomfortable for me. What are you doing? Why do I have to go through this pain? This doesn't make sense. I'm following you. I, I stepped up. I left basketball to pursue a life in ministry. I, I left all my friends, and I'm doing this, but I don't see you. This is not fair. And through this, I remember writing, and uh, Pastor CJ is kind of walking me through this. And I remember always texting me, are you okay? And I always was like, yep, I'm good. Until that night where I texted him and said, I'm not okay. And I started driving and I started praying. And he gave me a lot of advice, but one of the things I clung to was this verse. This verse got me through it. And going back to when Jesus said, you have little faith. He was telling me, man, I think people misinterpret that verse. I don't think Jesus was talking the amount. I think he was talking about the endurance of Peter's faith. He had a lot of faith, but Peter just keep walking to me. Keep walking. I know you don't feel it. I know you see the waves. I know it feels like you're going to drown, but Peter, trust me, it's me. And so he begins to walk. And this is what it was. He's, he begins to walk. He begins to step out and step out and keep walking. And then Jesus' face, he starts seeing, the, the man who we thought it was a ghost, he starts seeing different facial features. And I can almost see Peter, oh, Jesus, it's you. you just, keep, just keep moving. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. He, he sees the waves, though. He sees, he sees and, he's, and he's afraid. And I think this is the same thing we do. We, we see the waves, and it's, it's making us afraid. And and then, and then we see the water and we start drowning in our anxiety and we're overwhelmed and we almost give too much credit to our pain. But one thing I, I realized was why didn't Jesus come to the boat and come in there and, and then calm the sea? Why didn't he do that? Jesus, why didn't you take me and my parents and why didn't you just heal in the snap of a finger? Because I feel like he told me, Sometimes God makes you walk through it to show you that he's above it. He makes you walk through it to show you that, Alex, I am not a God who sits here on a Wednesday service. I am not a God who's here in Bible study. I'm the God of the storms. What storm, what pain in your life is greater than me? But if you give it to me, I will use what the enemy used to defeat you and I'll make you a leader. You guys gotta understand that your God loves you. He's obsessed with you. And then he's using it for your good. And the crazy thing about this, God just gave me another word. Like 
that wasn't the only thing though, is the last part of this story was the most powerful. And when you get onto the other side, and I'm gonna read this next part. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. They got in the boat, it all calmed down. They got to the other side of the tunnel. And what did they do? The man they claimed to be a ghost and distant became closer than ever and they worshiped him as God because listen to this. Changing God's title is vital. And what do I mean by that? When you begin to, when you, when you begin to go through a circumstance like that, God's title begins to change. Listen, I moved away. I left everything that was, uncom was comfortable for me, my friends, my mom that I went to, my family that I found protection in and comfortability. I had no one. And so my dad became my God. Listen, he, he, he held me and he was like, Alex, I know what you're going through, but listen, I am not your heavenly father, not some formal businessman, but I am your dad. Give it all to me. I know your dad is going through things, but give it to me. I love you and I will take care of you. Yeah. Changing God's title is vital, guys. And I don't know what you guys are going through in this room, but listen, this is not the end. I feel like right now, before this message, when I was preparing, there's someone in this room, I know there's multiple people who view God like this. They have such a small perception of this God and they think pain means they're doing something wrong, but it actually could use for your benefit. And I'm letting you know right now that guys, it's all your decision. We can live a life of faithfulness or wastefulness. It's your choice whether you wanna take that pain and give it to your God and grow, or do you just wanna worship it and kinda kind of just sit in it and just point a finger at God because that's not his intention. His intention is to grow you. I want you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. God, I don't know what it is, but I know you're speaking right now. So God, I, I'm gonna let you have your way. I'm gonna let you do what only you can do because nothing I have to say is worth it, God. There's kids in here that need to know that they're not alone, that they may be alone physically, but God, you are right there in the midst of the storm. You're the God above the storm and that you lift them up when they're drowning. And God, I pray right now that whoever's in this room that needs to hear that, you begin to speak to their heart in the name of Jesus. If that's any of you right now, I pray that you guys would raise your hand. Raise your hand right now if that's if this message was speaking to you tonight, that you've been dealing with some pain and you just need God to walk alongside you. Hands going up everywhere. I just wanna pray for you guys right now and we'll close out. God, I thank you for every single one in the hand and those that raised their hands and those who didn't. God, I pray that you would just be with them walking out here. But, but don't just confine yourself to these four walls, but I pray that they would develop a relationship that goes past that. And they begin to understand that you're a God of the storm. God, I pray for their weeks, God, and I pray that you would protect them and their mind and making uh, the enemy's mouth silent and so that your word can be spoken. God, I pray this all in your name, amen.